You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts. Hey everyone, this is Rich. If you're tuning in for episode 424 and the next installment in the Chattanooga story arc, well, sorry, you'll have to wait for that. Some of Tracy's family is in town visiting, and I may be a bit slow, but I've learned a few things in 20 plus years of marriage, and so I know it wouldn't be a good idea to try and have her sit down to record an episode this weekend. And I don't really feel like doing the next episode myself. It's surprisingly stressful to sit down and try to record an episode solo when hundreds of shows have conditioned you to doing it with a co-host. However, I do feel a strong desire to address something that has been in the news this past week and which is Civil War era related. And so I'm going to do that. Even though every time we take the opportunity to address current events, no matter how strong the connection to the Civil War, we end up hearing from folks who tell us they listen to the podcast for the history and don't want to hear us talk about anything having to do with what's going on here in the world real time. And, you know, I previously expressed my opinion about that viewpoint, but if that's you, okay, then please feel free to consider this an editorial, and you can skip it. Just stop listening right here, and you can tune back in next week when we'll return to Chattanooga and discuss what was going on there in October 1863. All right, for those of you who are still listening, I'd like to start off by sharing a quote by Bruce Catton, who was an American journalist who is best known today for the popular history books he wrote about the Civil War, one of which won him the Pulitzer Prize back in 1954. In one of his books, he wrote, We are a people to whom the past is forever speaking. We listen to it because we cannot help ourselves, for the past speaks to us with many voices. Far out of the dark nowhere, which is the time before we were born, men who were flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone went through fire and storm to break a path to the future. We are part of the future they died for. They are part of the past that bought the future. What they did the lives they lived, the sacrifices they made, the stories they told, and the songs they sang, and finally, the deaths they died, make up a part of our own experience. We cannot cut ourselves off from it. It is as real to us as something that happened last week. It is a basic part of our heritage as Americans. You know, one of the things that amazes us about doing this podcast, and has amazed us from day one, is that so many people aren't just casually interested in the Civil War, but it amazes us that so many people are so enthusiastic, passionate, excited when it comes to this part of our nation's past. I think that's because, even for us today, 
the Civil War and Reconstruction aren't simply a closed chapter in our dusty past. No, instead, the issues, events, and personalities of that era still speak to us today and make up a part of our own experience as Americans. Even here in the year 2023, almost 160 years after the last shots of the war were fired. What explains this continued passion about this part of our nation's past? Well, again, quoting Catton, he said, Here was the war that went closer to the bone and left a deeper imprint on the national spirit than any other war we ever fought. And I think that's true. And because it's true, and because we can't cut ourselves off from this part of our past, because it's a basic part of our heritage as Americans, it's vitally important that when it comes to the Civil War and Reconstruction, and the issues, events, and personalities of that era, it's vitally important that history is safeguarded against misinterpretation and that we correct misunderstanding. And of course, it's our duty to protect that history against the assault of outright lies. The history of the Civil War and Reconstruction is one of the most dynamic parts of our nation's past. The more I study the Civil War, the more I'm convinced it wasn't meant to be an ending, but was meant to be a beginning. Which is why, Lord willing, we're not going to be finished with this podcast until we also talk about Reconstruction. I'm convinced the war was not meant to be an end in itself, but rather was meant to be something from which we made a fresh start. Abraham Lincoln, I think, came to this same understanding, which is why he talked in the Gettysburg Address about a new birth of freedom. And during Reconstruction, there were tantalizing glimpses of what it might mean for us to live up to Lincoln's vision. But as a nation, we ended up badly dropping the ball when it came to the opportunity to make a fresh start, to make real Lincoln's hope that the war would lead to a new birth of freedom. In the aftermath of the war, we as Americans were given an opportunity beyond price, paid for by blood and treasure. But tragically, we ended up throwing away that chance to make a fresh start. The real tragedy of Reconstruction lies in what might have been and was not. Yes, when the shooting was over, the war had saved the Union and destroyed slavery, but there was still a bit of unfinished business, which sadly continues to vex us to this day. The unfinished business after the end of the war was the extraordinarily difficult problem of race relations. Yes, slavery had been destroyed and blacks were now free, but to whites, the freed black seemed to present as many problems as the enslaved black. Aside from the obvious moral aspect of equality, the problem back then was political, and it was economic. And in the end, in the 1870s, the white men, who in the America of that time were the ones who held economic and political power, well, they decided to stop trying to find a solution to the problem. In the South, they were fine with this, because they were desperate to turn back the clock and reimpose a system of white supremacy and economic and political power over blacks. And in the North, they were tired of trying to solve such a thorny and difficult problem, especially when it had very little, if anything, to do with advancing their own economic and political agendas. Although Reconstruction saw the ratification of the 14th and 15th Amendments, 
expanding the rights and suffrage of blacks, it failed to carry through with charting a progressive course for race relations after the abolition of slavery. And so the aftermath of Reconstruction was characterized by the increasingly oppressive nature of Southern state governments, as whites, through legislation and terror and violence, reimposed a system of white supremacy upon their society and ensured blacks would be second-class citizens, economically and politically. There are those who act as if race relations and racial injustice are new problems, but the truth is it's been a part of America's story from the very beginning. <laughs> Whether you want to trace that beginning back to 1776 with the signing of the Declaration of Independence, or if you want to go all the way back to 1619 when the first ship carrying slaves to be sold arrived on our shores. In any case, after the end of Reconstruction, through Jim Crow and segregation and voting rights abuses, it would take nearly a century until the 1960s for America to begin to come to terms once again with Reconstruction's failures regarding race relations and racial injustice. Great strides were made in the 1960s with regard to civil rights, but it's disturbing, isn't it, and unspeakably sad that it's 2023, and as a nation, we continue to wrestle with those very same issues. Because it's an ongoing struggle, it's vitally important that the history of slavery and the Civil War and Reconstruction be safeguarded against misinterpretation and that we correct misunderstanding and of course, it's our duty to protect that history against the assault of outright lies. This past week, there has been quite a ruckus over part of Florida's 2023 state academic standards for social studies that calls for lessons which, quote, examine the various duties and trades performed by slaves, e.g., agricultural work, painting, carpentry, tailoring, domestic service, blacksmithing, transportation, end quote. The clarification that accompanies this point says, quote, instruction includes how slaves developed skills, which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit, end quote. Well, the condemnation of this part of Florida's academic standards for social studies arises from opposition to the claim that slaves benefited in any way from being enslaved. And certainly, it's at the very least ill-advised to speak of any sort of personal benefit to an enslaved person especially when set against the sum of the horrors of the slave trade and the unspeakable cruelty and injustice of America's system of chattel slavery, which was characterized by physical and emotional abuse, outright torture, sexual violence, and the breaking apart of families when members were sold off. In any case, the language used is also curious, since within the slave-based economic system of the antebellum South, any job skills a slave was allowed to develop would have been meant to benefit his or her owner. Enslaved persons were never permitted to forget they were their owner's property, and that they were considered property because they were black. Slavery was racist and dehumanizing. To claim that an enslaved person benefited in any way from being enslaved is to 
tread dangerously close to perpetuating the happy and contented slave narrative, which was the systemic portrayal of blacks as joyous recipients and satisfied participants in the institution of slavery. There's also John C. Calhoun's infamous assertion that slavery was, quote-unquote, a positive good. And so it's just my two cents, but it seems as if it might be a good idea to reconsider this portion of Florida's academic standards for social studies, since any claim that an enslaved person benefited in any way from being enslaved is not only impossible to defend from a moral standpoint, but it's bad history as it needlessly opens the door to misunderstanding or distortion. We are a people to whom the past is forever speaking, and whether we like it or not, whether it makes us uncomfortable, slavery is a basic part of our heritage as Americans. When it comes to the history of slavery and the Civil War and Reconstruction, it's important we get that history right, because it's not just a closed chapter in our dusty past. Instead, the issues, events, and personalities of that era do still speak to us today, as we're still engaged in a struggle involving race relations and racial injustice. And as we continue to work to get that part of our national story right, maybe it will free us free us, each of us, to view our lives and our times as an opportunity to tackle head-on the problem of race relations and racial injustice, and in that way for us to carry through, finally, with making the most of that fresh start the Civil War gave to us as a nation. Real quick, we just want to tack on a couple of book recommendations. The first is Forever Free, The Story of Emancipation and Reconstruction by Eric Foner. That's F-O-N-E-R. The second is Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, which is the recent outstanding Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Douglass by David W. Blight. So there you go. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts.